Hey guys, go to Bambi TV. Guys, we're going to be reacting to Jordan Peterson confronted by the reality of Jesus. Guys, this is going to be awesome. First of all, I love Jordan Peterson. Yes. So let's get out and let's check this out. Jesus is a personal savior. So let's check this out. We have at the heart of every living cell the longest word we've ever found, the genetic code. And all of that leads me to formulate it as follows, that we live in a word-based universe. Jordan Peterson and John Lennox finally sat down and had a chat. I've been waiting for this to happen for ages, hoping it would happen. It's finally happened. They cover so many interesting parts in this conversation. The section that I'm gonna feature in this video deals specifically with the idea of logos. There's also a little clip at the end that I'm gonna play from where Jordan Peterson is responding to this idea in a extremely emotional way. It's very interesting. I'm gonna stop talking. Why am I still talking? Let's dive in. I just completed a couple of documentaries with the Daily Wire Plus crew, and one of them was in Athens, and two were in Jerusalem. And we were trying to puzzle out the um, relationship between Greek thought and, and Judeo-Christian thought, most particularly the strange happenstance that the Greek idea of an intrinsic logos in the world seemed to dovetail with the Judeo-Christian idea of, you might say, the, uh, of the word incarnate in the human psyche. And it seemed to me, and obviously to other observers, that there was an affinity between the Greek idea that the cosmos had an intrinsic comprehensibility and the idea that the proper orientation for human beings ethically would be one of honest communication and investigation. And those two things snapped on top of each other. And it, 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 it made me think of something that I actually learned from Richard Dawkins. And I think this is a deep idea. Dawkins wrote a very influential essay where he claimed that any organism that can function in an environment has to be a microcosm of that environment. So for example, if you were an alien biologist and you were presented with a terrestrial bird and you took the bird apart, you could infer from the bird's structure the gravitational pull of the earth, the density of the atmosphere, the, um, the chemical composition of the atmosphere, the electromagnetic frequency that the sun light was, uh, what would you say, most, at, at what electromagnetic frequencies the sun's light was most amenable to vision, etc. You could derive a model of the environment from the physiology of the organism. Now, I know that there were medieval ideas that were, that were deep in Christianity, that the human soul was a microcosm of the cosmos, right? That it reflected the structure of reality itself. And I've been thinking about this in terms of how the world might be best conceptualized. So there's a mix of ideas here. And if, we're, if an organism has to be a microcosm of the cosmos in order to function, and we are a microcosm in that regard, and we are a personality that runs on a narrative, which we seem to be, then in what way is it reasonable to claim that the, the cosmos itself is best conceptualized as something that can be entered into relationship with personality to personality, and that that's not the most fundamental reflection of reality? I mean, it seems to me that that's where Dawkins' thought eventually points if his proclamation that an organism has to be a microcosm, an accurate microcosm in order to survive is accurate, so. Okay, one very brief point of clarification here before John Lennox dives in is to say this, that the universe itself is also a part of that microcosm that along with humanity and the rest of creation are all reflecting something that is true about God who is outside of space, time, and matter. And so it's not that the universe has a personality that's connecting with the human personality. It's that humanity and the natural world are together reflecting things that are true about the creator of both. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive back in. Now that dovetails with the idea that the logos as a personality, so that would be the Judeo-Christian concept, 
can investigate the logos of the universe and that those things dovetail. I'm, so now, I know that's a complicated mishmash of ideas, but I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I, I think there's a lot in that, actually. And I recall listening to you give a very interesting lecture on Genesis 1. And when you came to the statement that human beings are made in the image of God, you paused and you pointed out that this was the cornerstone of our civilization. And I agree with that entirely. I think that what Dawkins is saying actually points in the exact opposite direction to what his worldview is, which is atheism, of course. In other words, that we can read off from creation something about the idea of a creator. And as you say, it dovetails perfectly. Let me put this another way. I'm a mathematician by background and a linguist. I love language, and mathematics is a very sophisticated language, but I love natural languages as well. And it seems to me that where this fits together best is first in the fact that we can do science in the sense that there is a rational intelligibility to the universe, which is the foundation of modern science and is a legacy of the biblical worldview. So that the mathematical describability, uh, Einstein talked about he couldn't imagine any genuine scientist without faith in that. It's the axiom for doing science is to believe the universe is intelligible. But if you ask for the rationale behind that, why do we believe the universe is intelligible? It bears the imprint of a creator. And I see that at the level of mathematics, it has capacity to, at least in part, give us a handle on what's out there. And also in biology, where we, we have at the heart of every living cell the longest word we've ever found, the genetic code. And all of that leads me to formulate it as follows, that we live in a word-based universe. And that's the key of the Logos for me. Okay, and so what do you mean in that case? So what do you mean specifically that we live in a word-based universe? What does that mean for you on the broader conceptual landscape? Well, it means that this universe is not simply a product of natural, unguided forces. It is a product of a rational creator, an intelligent creator, and I believe even more than that, a personal creator. Now, how I get there is only in part. Guys, guys, I, I feel goosebumps right here. I feel goosebumps. Remember he said, we live in a world-based universe. Do you remember how the universe was created? God said, let's live the light, and there was light. Like, I, I, need, I need to write something down. I need to write something down. Let's get back into this. Let's get back into this. From a response to the universe as I find it, the point you made about each organism being a microcosm of its environment, it's also... It seems to me that there are two sources, two major sources of knowledge. Uh, there is, first of all, observing the universe, science, etc. Then there are the humanities. But there's also the concept of revelation, in which I believe. In other words, it's not simply the human quest for the creator. It's the creator revealing himself. So for me, the anchor point in the end is that the Logos became human, and we beheld his glory. In other words, we can see exactly what this means in terms of what we can understand. That is the human uh, being in which God encoded himself in Christ. Now, those are big ideas, of course. They're very deep ideas. They need unpacking. But that's essentially where I'm coming from. All right, we're going to transition for a second into a clip here where Jordan Peterson is really reckoning with this idea of Logos, and he actually comes to tears as he thinks about it. Very briefly, I'm going to give you guys a few verses that kind of help define this idea of the Logos becoming flesh, of the incarnation, of God the Creator becoming God the knowable, named individual 
person at a brief and temporary and specific point in history. So here's what that sounds like. In the beginning was the Word, or Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So this is John chapter 1. Now listen, watch this right here, as Jordan Peterson is comprehending the meaning and the significance and the stakes attached to the thought that Christ, Jesus, in history could be that ethereal word or logos manifesting himself in history. Here is Jordan Peterson. Let's take a listen. So what you have in the figure of Christ is an actual person who actually lived plus a myth and in some sense, Christ is the union of those two things. The problem is, is I probably believe that, but I don't know. Okay. I don't, I'm amazed at my own belief and I don't <laughs> understand it. Like, because I've seen. Sometimes the objective world and the narrative world touch you know, that's Jungian synchronicity. Yeah. And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real. Like, we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world. But the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that in principle is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, and that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too, it, partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. If you believed in the story of Christ, or if you believed that history and, and let's say the narrative make meet, let's Both, say. Both, I yeah. think, I think you, because when you believe that, you buy both those stories. You believe that yeah. the narrative and the objective can actually touch. Jesus is the one who has made it possible for imperfect humans to be able to enter into a relationship with a perfect God. In order to enter into this relationship, something very important is, requ is required. It might even be the chief virtue, the virtue of all virtues. If pride is the sin of all sins, then humility would be the virtue of all virtues. And it's exactly that, it's humility that is required to look to the Lamb of God hung on a cross, the Creator become the Redeemer, extending His arms out wide, offering forgiveness. And the only requirement is acceptance and humility and a recognition that there is some connection between one's own internal moral state and that suffering that took place on the cross. There's some need that we have for that act. It's so accessible through Christ. It's so beautiful because of the sacrifice. It's so heroic because of what he's been willing to do for us. And it's made available to all because all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so salvation is made available to all. I hope that this idea of logos connects to the idea of forgiveness and the very present reality that is available to you, listener, viewer of this video. The darkness can give way to the dawn, winter can pass, and guilt be forgiven. Thanks for watching. See you guys in the next video. Guys, this is actually amazing. Like, this is, this is brilliant. And to be honest, I still want to search, now that I sent myself that message, I want to search on it. I want to do my finding. Like, it's, it's, it's powerful for you to say we live in a world based universe because I feel your words, your thoughts. Like, that's why if you read any self, like, if you read any self productive book, you see, like, the words you say to yourself, Matt, is like, don't believe to yourself. Don't hear things that won't elevate your spirit. Don't listen to things that will make you like, that will make you become good. Like that will take things away from you. Like listen to music that are not 
right you know this music does not impact my life like i feel the words we take in and the words we give out actually change the words like it changed the world we are right now guys so like just we live in a world based in that it's actually like i feel good when i'm saying it because i feel this is something i've actually talked of before and me hearing it now makes me want to do some search and some findings like that's like god honestly watch your tongue like it's it's there like i believe jesus is our savior and i don't believe that anyone can go to the father except through him and with jesus your sins are forgiven to be honest the scary part is when you know your sins are forgiven and you commit sin again like that that's what gets to me because deep down you know you don't do it like you don't do it but i don't know more like you know you're still be forgiven and you do it 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 hurts like it hurts you knowing that you know the truth like you know what's right for you to do and you don't do it like i feel that the fucked up part like to be honest, it breaks my heart every time I committed sin knowing it. Like, I feel like, I don't know, like, more like I know I'm forgiving, but I can't forgive myself. Because more like I'm taking it for granted. Like, I found the truth and I am taking it for granted. More like immediately I do it, I just think of it and I feel really, really bad. And to be honest, I asked Messi again, but like, I feel one the need asking if I'm still gonna do it. Okay, I need help. Like, I feel we all do, and I think I am trying, like, I'm trying my best to, like, live a life that I, I, I don't believe anyone can be perfect, to be honest. You know, if you are perfect, there's no need for salvation. But, like, I believe we can actually appreciate the fact that. Jesus actually died for us. And I feel we should aim at perfection because we're supposed to live a Christ like life. Like that, that's the goal. Like that's the reason we are Christians. But guys, tell me what you think about this video. Then share to like, share, subscribe to my channel. This actually makes me emotional. Guys, I'll see you next time, guys. Please.